Good morning, everyone. Always a joy and a privilege to stand up here and um, just love you by bringing God's word and to trust what he is going to be saying to us. Uh, many of you would know that over the course of the last few weeks, we've been introducing a course that we have wanted to start, a course on apologetics, and we started it this last Wednesday. And in this first week, we spoke about worldviews and how there are different worldviews and how each worldview tries to explain and understand reality in different ways. And a worldview needs to really answer some of the big questions of life. And regardless of whether you believe in a different religion or whether you're an atheist, the worldview that you adopt has to be able to explain many different things, including the human condition. So what do I mean by the human condition? What I mean by that is that on one hand, humans are capable of greatness, Humans are capable of building just incredible cities and engineering and science and, and technology. Humans are capable of moving our hearts with art and with beauty and with music. Humans are capable of such great love and making the world a better place because of that love. And humans are so good at messing it all up. Right, and so you can have this engineer that's capable of building skyscrapers, and at the same time, he is so lonely because of a string of failed marriages. You can have an artist that is so capable to move our hearts in the deep place to see such beauty in this world, and at the same time, that very same artist can be so just financially corrupt, for example. The same CEO that can build a, a global company can be just so fraught with addictions. And you know, it is so easy to point at everybody else, but that fact is true of every single one of us. Whereby we are all capable of bringing such goodness into this world. Such beauty and, and creativity and if I can even say power, and making the world a better place, we are all so capable of such great love. And at the same time, every single one of us is probably so painfully aware of the times we don't, of our struggles and our failures, of our shortcomings, what that does to us, what that does to our relationship with God and what that does to the people around us. Now, the, the way that the average person kind of shrugs that idea off is by simply responding in by saying, well, well, nobody's perfect. And that is 100% true, nobody is perfect. Now, I raise all of this because we as a church are on a journey learning what it means to follow Jesus. We're discovering that the journey of follow Jesus, when he says to you and me, follow me, he doesn't simply mean, you know, get the attendance register out and make sure you go to church enough times per month. No, it is far more far reaching with regards to how we live our lives between Mondays and Sundays, as well as even what we do when we engage here together. What it means to follow Jesus and the way we're kind of unpacking this is following Jesus looks like being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus does. For the most part, the first half of this year, we focused on being with Jesus, how to be with his presence and how to enjoy that. But we're also starting to realize that part of the process is becoming like Jesus. And obviously, the more time we are being with Jesus, the more naturally inclined we will become like Jesus. But the last few weeks, we're talking about some of the things that get in the way of being with Jesus and becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus did. Last week, we had a really uncomfortable conversation around repentance. 
And if you were here, uh, maybe you would remember that the biggest takeaway of repentance is that repentance is not God standing in front of you like an angry school teacher trying to confess, get you to confess to something you did wrong. Because when you did that in school, you know what happened next was you got punished. And so for many of us, repentance is we seeing God as if I confess, he's gonna punish me. Whereas last week we learned that repentance is about turning towards the life that God has for us. Because he is not like our angry school teachers. Repentance is just turning towards life, turning towards life and turning away from those things that are not the life of God. And so today we're gonna deep dive something we raised last week and we're gonna take it a little bit further. And so today we're gonna have another uncomfortable conversation and yet I hope that something in you shifts. It is around the concept of sin and how sin gets in the way of life and us being with Jesus and us becoming like Jesus and us doing what Jesus did. Now to help us do this, we're gonna be reading from Psalm 32. And uh, I would encourage you to have your Bibles out, whether they're kind of paper Bibles or digital Bibles. And uh, you know, every now and again, I think what God does for us is He just whispers His favor upon us and He confirms certain things among us. And uh, as we were chatting this morning as a worship team, I mean, Psalm 32 is not a very familiar psalm. This will be the first time I'm ever preaching on Psalm 32. And yet one of our worship leaders was just like, I was reading Psalm 32 last night with the Lord. And so I believe God is wanting to meet with us this morning. So let's read Psalm 32. And we're gonna start off by reading verse one to two. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. This paints the picture of us walking with God with a clear conscience. Walking in a blessed, clear, open relationship with God, a forgiven relationship with God. There is no deceit, there is no hiding, there is nothing between us and Him. That is what God wants for us. But already in these verses, He talks about this idea of sin. And so I think it's worthwhile just pausing to wrap our minds around what sin is. Because it's one of those words that most of us think we know what it means and you're probably 90% there. Well, one of the weird things about the word sin as well as many other Christian words is that they become exactly that. They become Christian words. They become religious words. Whereas the words both in the New and the Old Testament for sin were not Christian words. They were not religious words. They were just words words. There were words that could be used in culture to describe any number of things and they could be appropriated into our walk with God to describe a specific reality, in this case, a sin. Let me give you an example. One of the Hebrew words, in fact, the main Hebrew word for sin is the word katar. And the word katar literally means to miss a target. And so we have found it used to describe when kind of slingshots, you know, they're practicing and they're trying to hit a target. And then when they miss, they catar the target. They didn't sin. Ooh, I just missed. The book of Proverbs talks about us making hasty decisions. And you must be careful when you make hasty decisions because you might catar the destination you're supposed to be heading towards. Meaning making hasty decisions might cause you to miss out on where you need to be going. So the word Qatar literally means to miss a target. So if sin or Qatar means to miss a target, it begs the question, well, what are we aiming for? What is the target? Now, depending on your church background, many of you have probably been trained to answer that question in the following way. The target is the righteous law of God. Because the law of God is the righteous expression of His holiness 
And so when we obey the law, we are in right standing with God. And when we sin, it is because we fail to meet the standards of the law. Now, in a similar way to the thing that I mentioned last week, which I don't have time to recover, while that is true, it is only a small part of the picture. You see, if in our own imaginations, if the target is obeying the list of rules that honestly, some of us feel are really arbitrary at times. And God is like taking register with regards to how well I'm doing today. And sin is every time I break the law, or break the rule. It's kind of me versus the law. It's me versus this impersonal expression that we call righteousness. And I don't know how helpful that is. I believe the bigger picture may be more helpful to you and then we'll understand how the law fits into the bigger picture. So Stephen, what is the bigger picture? What is the target? What are we aiming at? That if we miss, that is Qatar, that is sin. Now, I don't have time to kind of open up all the passages. We've done this before a number of years ago. But in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one, just here's just free advice on how to think theologically. Sin enters the world, Genesis chapter three. If you have a question about what are God's intentions for? What are God's intentions for marriage? What are God's intentions for life? What are God's intentions for our purpose? We go to Genesis one and two. Almost every major theme of what God wants for us is found in Genesis 1 and 2 before sin enters the picture. And so it stands to reason that that, if that is true, then God's work is going to be restoring what He always intended in Genesis 1 and 2. So what does God intend for us in Genesis 1 and 2? Well, Genesis 1 describes that we alone among all the creatures are created in the image of God. Genesis 2 verse 7 describes the fact that only us, humanity, among all the creatures are given a special breath of God. Giving us a special way of relating to who God is, His life, what He supplies, and all of this enabling us to live out what it means to be the image of God. And so upon every single human being is an inherent dignity that comes from being made in the image of God. So we stand alone amongst all of God's creation, even angels. But as we unpack in Genesis 1, what does that look like? Well, part of what that looks like is, and I'm gonna use the word image in a verb form, we become images, E-R-S. We image God. We image God by walking well with Him, by representing Him well, by living well, receiving well what He gives, receiving His wisdom, His power, His leadership, His love. So that when we do image Him, when we do live our lives, Consequently, there's more of God and more of God's kingdom and life and love and creativity in this world. That is what God wants for us. That is the target. Jesus summed this up when someone asked, well, what are the two greatest commandments? Or what is the greatest commandments? And Jesus said, well, the first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we could summarize that by saying our calling, the way we live out a flourishing human life of love, Living out God's love and power is by learning to love God and love others. Learning to love God and love others. And it is into this context that the law comes. Because the law is the flip side of the same coin. If Genesis 1 and 2 is, here's what I want you to be and to do. As Jesus expresses, love God and love others. 
the law is, well, here are the things that take you away from that. So don't do that stuff. For example, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first half of the Ten Commandments are all about loving God and the kinds of things that get in the way of loving God. The second half of the Ten Commandments are about loving others and the kinds of things that get in the way of us loving others. So yes, when we fail to do that, inherently, yes, we would have broken a law. But the greater, bigger picture is I have failed to live out what it means to walk well with God, to represent Him well, to love Him well, to receive His love and His power well, His leadership well, how He empowers me well, and I fail to love others well. You can take any of Jesus' commands, any of the commands in the New Testament of Paul or Peter, and you'll always boil it down to, it's either loving God or loving others. This is why Jesus says of all the commandments, Matthew twenty two forty, 40, all the law, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now what makes God's ways sometimes difficult for us is when we happen to disagree. So when God says, true life is found in me, but we look for life in sex and power and finance and popularity. When Jesus says, here's, by the way, going back to Genesis 1 and 2, here's how I define sex. And we're like, ah, oh, I prefer how the series Friends defines sex. When God says, here's what anger is actually all about, and we go, actually, I prefer how I live out my anger here in South Africa. And this is why last week, one of the key elements of repentance is changing our minds, whereby we become willing to lay down what we think and what we want and pick up what God wants for us because what he wants for us ultimately is to live this life of loving God, loving others. And for him, this is what it means to image him into this world. And when we do that, well, there is a net increase of his kingdom and a net pushing back of darkness. So now that we may be better understanding our purpose, what is the target? What are we aiming for? Let's get back to Psalm 32, where it starts off, I'm gonna read again, verse one and two. Whoa, I've just lost my, there we go. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, listen to verse three. When I kept silence, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. This is a description of unconfessed sin, unrepented sin some sense of God speaking and God calling and God inviting me to different choices and yet me choosing to ignore his voice, me choosing to hold on to my sin and slowly starting to increasingly experience the death of the consequences of my sin as well as just in my conscience the consequences of keeping silence before God. I wonder if you've ever experienced these verses yourself. I know I have. You see, this is kind of strange about the human nature. If God's ways are good, if God's ways are just and right, if God's ways are all about life and His joy and His kingdom and His love and His power, it should make sense to us, right, that it becomes a no-brainer. Just do what he says. 
Why is it therefore that we continually live these verses out? Why do we continually hold on to our sin, which we know is bringing death to our own lives, death to our relationships, death to our relationship with God? My conscience is experiencing what the conscience of the psalmist wrote down in these words. You see, we do what our first parents, Adam and Eve, did in chapter three. And they just set the road for us and every single one of us does it from that point onwards where we sin. And instead of running back towards the God who loves us, instead of recognizing, yes, I have failed, but in you there is life, we hide. We hide, we cover up, maybe no one will notice. Maybe my wife won't notice. Hey, maybe God won't notice. Because I went to church, right? He took attendance. So we hide, we cover up, we blame. Oh, it's everybody else's fault but mine. And so we do the same thing. But then something changes between verse four and verse five, where the psalmist writes, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, hold on to that verse. I want to come back to this verse because it's the heart of what today is about. But I want you to notice kind of a flow of what's going on. The first few verses, here's what God wants for us. Living in a transparent, life-giving relationship with Him in forgiveness. Then this description of unconfessed sin. Then this moment of confession. And then listen to what follows. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. You see, as the psalmist confessed his sin, did he get the stick? Did he get punishment? Did he get this condescending, aha, gotcha. I just needed you to admit to me how pathetic you were. No. He discovers this God who protects him. He discovers this God who is his safe place. He discovers that while he was hiding in his imagination, God was this cruel bully. And as he steps out into the light, he discovers that the safest place to be, even with my sin, is in the presence of God. So once again, what God wants for us, followed up by us hiding and denying and covering up, living in the consequences of our sin, followed by confession, followed by just joy and deliverance and living what God wants for us. So now I wanna go back to verse five, the hinge points between pain and joy. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I want you to notice that this is a full unveiling. Notice how he says, I did not cover up. You see, we as Christians, we learn how to pretend confess. We learn how to make it look like I'm confessing when I'm not really confessing. We say to a friend, we say to God, yeah, I'm really struggling at the moment. We don't share what's really going on. We're, not, we're too ashamed to name whatever's going on because again, we're afraid of maybe not God's response always, but maybe we're afraid of how this person may reject me, how this person may punish me. And so we euphemize. 
Ah, oh, yeah, I'm struggling with lust. Without actually going into the detail of what that actually looks like. Oh, I'm really struggling at the moment. Without actually saying, I'm so filled with anger right now. There's this full disclosure and let me say, listen, if you're gonna go there with God and if you're gonna go there with someone else, we'll get to that in a second. It is gonna feel like open heart surgery because you are never gonna feel so vulnerable as that moment you pull open your ribcage to expose the true hearts of whatever's going on in your life at that moment. We need to be willing to do that. Tyler Statton, in his book on prayer, going through the Lord's Prayer, he says this about this moment. He says, one of the names thrown around for Jesus is the great physician. But a doctor can't heal you without an accurate diagnosis. If you show up to a great doctor and describe yourself as generally sick, they're not going to be able to do a lot for you. To confess is to say, I want to name my symptoms completely and comprehensively because I want healing completely and comprehensively. I don't want partial healing. I don't want my fake self, my mask to be healed. I want to be healed. And so I need to reveal me. And so confession is learning to do that. And when we get that, how does God respond? Think about the prodigal son coming home in his mind. The speech that was planned was, God, I do not deserve to be a son. Make me a slave. How does the father respond? I will have nothing of that. You are my son and I'm celebrating you coming home. That is how God responds to our confession. 1 John 1 verses 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just and will not maybe, he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Because God wants life for you, rightness, loving God and loving others. I love how Eugene Peterson says it. He says, God does not deal with sin by ridding our lives of it as if it were a germ or mice in the attic. God does not deal with sin by amputation as if it were a gangrenous leg leaving us crippled, holiness on a crutch. God deals with sin by forgiving us. And when he forgives us, there is more of us, not less. Why? Because the target is thriving under the Lordship of God, loving God, loving others, more of God's kingdom in and through our lives. And so when we come into this forgiven relationship with God, we are blessed and others are blessed through us. There is more of us, not less. By the way, this answers a question that um, I've been asked a number of times, whereby people say, Listen, Stephen, you know, if uh, getting saved is all about recognizing who Jesus is and what he's done on the cross and me kind of confessing my sins to God and, and now I'm a child of God, now my sins have been atoned for, now I'm saved, why is it that I need to pray for forgiveness from that moment onwards? Because many of you have heard people like me stand up and say things like, on the cross, all sins have been paid for, past, present, and future, which is gloriously and wonderfully true. Okay, well, Stephen, why? I mean, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins. Why pray for forgiveness if I've already done it and if my sins have been covered? Well, I, I think Jesus knew what he was doing, right? Right? Hey, let's assume Jesus knew what he was doing when he taught us to pray this daily. By the way, the earliest Christians used to pray this three times a day. 
forgive us our sins. You see, what's going on there is the same reason that the reason why you're married is not because of what happened on your wedding day, but how you live that out. Not just because you chose your wife once, but because you choose her daily. And you're doing everything you can in your power to live out this beautiful reality of marriage. And so in the same way, yes, the day I'm saved, my sins are covered, but now I'm choosing to walk with God. And I'm choosing to remain in right relationship with Him. And I'm choosing to remain in this blessed state of forgiveness and life and love. And so I choose to daily choose His kingdom and not my own. I choose to daily bring my sin before Him. Because it is in that moment that we are transformed. Church, it is an absolute fallacy. You need to get this out of your heads that the more mature you are in faith, the less you have to confess the contrary is true. Paul, at the end of his life, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament describes himself as the greatest of sinners. Not because he was back doing all the things that he used to do before Christ, but rather as he recognizes how he is, if Shrek is 100% right about us, we're like an onion. And my sin goes deeper. And my sin goes deeper. And suddenly I may be even doing the right things with the wrong motives. And so the greatest saints are confessing more because they know that God is good when we stand in the light with Him. And they know that that is the process of their transformation. We see this in how Jesus responds to sinners. I've often said that, and I challenge you, go find any story in the Gospels, how Jesus responds to sinners. It's always He's moving towards them. He's bringing grace. He is bringing truth. It's that right diagnosis of our condition. He's bringing forgiveness and freedom. The harshest words Jesus has is for those who think they don't need forgiveness. In other words, the self-righteous religious types, those are the ones who get Jesus' harshest words. We somehow get it the other way around. We're like, oh, look at him, look at her, they're amazing. And then we have condemnation for sinners. Rather, the ministry of Jesus is to bring forgiveness to us and to experience life and freedom when we trust Him, and even when you trust Him with our sin. This is exactly what even the cross is about. 1 Peter 2, 24. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. When you hear that word righteousness, don't just think being a morally good boy or girl. It definitely includes that. But it's living out this Genesis 1 and 2 vision of humanity, living rightly according to God's plan and design for us. That's what God wants for us. But this can be painful. I've used this illustration before only a couple of years ago, but it is so powerful. So I'm going to use it again about a boy called Eustace, character in one of C.S. Lewis's, um, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Eustace finds himself in possession of this large treasure. And so he does what every single one of us in this room would have done. He lies down amongst this treasure and he's dreaming of all the great things he could do with this treasure. And he wakes up a dragon. 
just this picture of how greed has taken over his heart. He also quickly realizes he is in great physical pain. You see, he put a golden bracelet over his arm and now he's this big, ugly dragon and this bracelet is causing him great pain. Aslan is this picture, is this lion, this picture of Jesus. And Aslan comes to Eustace and leads him to the top of a mountain. At the top of the mountain is a garden and there is this water. And Aslan says, you need to get into this water and you will be healed. And the only condition is, but you must be undressed. Now, he's not talking about clothes. He's saying you need to become your true self. So Eustace is so desperate to get into that water and be healed. He starts taking his claws and he starts tearing off this dragon skin only to reveal layers of dragon skin beneath those first few layers. And then a second layer of dragon skin goes off only to reveal a third layer of dragon skin until he realizes there is nothing he can do to rid himself of the dragon skin. So then Aslan says, let me undress you. And this is what C.S. Lewis writes, the very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurts worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off. Just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I as smooth and as soft as a peeled switch and smaller than I had been. And then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much for I was very tender underneath now, now that I had no skin on. And he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm. And then I saw why I turned into a boy again. After a bit, the lion took me out and dressed me in new clothes. Doesn't that well express our own measly efforts at dealing with the things that stand in the way of the life that God wants for us. And this is why we need a savior. This is why we need the lion of Judah. We need to be willing to allow him to do in us what we could not do for ourselves. And so just to give us a few thoughts and then we're gonna have some time to kind of do this together. And the first one is we need to have, it starts off with verse one and two, it starts off with a vision of what God wants for you. If all you have in your mind is this righteous judge up in heaven, who's noting every time you break the law, and so your only motivation is, don't break the law, don't break the law, don't break the law, that is not very motivating. But when we understand what God created us for, that we become somehow mysterious conduits of his life and his kingdom and his power and his love, as we love God and love others, that's what he wants for us. We need to recapture that. My suggestion to you is to not simply sit there and go, you know what, Stephen, I think you're right, done. What I've learned is that I'm like a goldfish and I forget these things very quickly. And my vision of God, the harsh judge up there, comes back like that. And so I'm just telling you what works for me. But when I'm in prayer, one way to do it is think about the first two words of the Lord's Prayer, our Father. Oh, our Father. Before we get to forgive us our sins, it's our Father. God, you are my good father. Pray it out on repeat. 
God, you're a good father. You only want good things for me. Lord, you're a God who wants life for me. Your ways are true. You want me to flourish. You want me to be in a right relationship with you. You want me to love you more and to know your love more. You want me to love others more and for them to know their love through me. You want my life to make a difference. You want my life somehow as I work with your spirit to be a place through which your kingdom comes. That's what you want for me, God. Hold on to that and preach to yourself in prayer. Just like David does, why so downcast, oh my soul. If you don't start there, we're gonna lose our motivation, but we do need to move on to full disclosure. A full diagnosis. My suggestion is to get hold of, of a diary, a journal, to allow time sitting before God and say, God, reveal my sin to me. Remember, I already know He is good. I already know He's the place of life. I already know He loves me. So now it's an invitation into more of that life. But Lord, what's standing in the way? And write it down. Name it for what it is in as, as much detail as you are able to. Allow the slits of the talons of the line of God to rip open that dragon skin. Allow yourself to feel vulnerable before a holy God. Then number three, receive forgiveness. This is a guarantee. There's not many things we can count on in life. This is one thing we can count on because he is faithful and just that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us and purify us. And so we don't have to kind of get down on our knees and self-flagellate and somehow earn forgiveness. Jesus did that for us. We get to, in our vulnerable state of exposed sin, we get to receive the gift of life and forgiveness. And listen, everything in you is gonna fight that. This is not right. I need to deserve forgiveness. And then you confess that too. And you preach the gospel to yourself in your heart. And then you say, Lord, you tell me that you are faithful and just. As I confess my sin and I feel so unworthy right now, you forgive me. You accept me right here, right now. Jesus has borne my sins, as we read now, on the cross. So Lord, I receive that forgiveness. And then number four, enjoy the life of God. Don't just stop at this transaction, job done. Go back to where we started. Here's what God wants for you, for your relationships. And so I'm gonna ask if Craig and maybe Vernon, if you guys can bring, we're gonna do something similar to what we did last week. We're gonna have the cross before us. And we're gonna have an opportunity to allow the voice of God to speak to us. We're gonna have some music playing gently. And here's an opportunity to take another step. Remember last week was a step. I gave you some homework to take another step. Well, here's another step. Or maybe you weren't here last week, so here's step one of many, but an opportunity to respond to the life God wants for you, agreeing with Him, with His estimation of what is holding you back, AKA sin. And as an opportunity for us to put this into some action, I'm gonna invite us just to come forward. You may want to kneel, you may want to stand. 
but to come before the mercy and the grace of God. To see the place where Jesus bore your sins so that you need not bear your sins. So Holy Spirit, may we sense this invitation, this invitation to life, a blessed walk with you, us fulfilling this calling of imaging you well to this world, of receiving well what you give, your life, your power, your love, your grace, your ways. But Holy Spirit, speak to us about our sin, how we have missed that mark. And then we come to you, we come to the cross. We confess, and church, I just encourage you to to speak it out with God with as much clarity as He gives you. And then we will receive forgiveness together because of who God is and what Jesus has done.